Good afternoon and welcome to Visualizing Math with Stella. My name is Kareem Shashakli. Uh, I've been a math teacher at high school level for 10 years, all levels, and uh, I am here with Diana Fisher. Are you there, Diana? I am here. Thank you very much. I'm also a high school teacher and have been a high school teacher for quite a long time. Um, and we welcome you to this webinar. We'll be going over first of all a few think constructs in Stella but then we'll go over how to solve simultaneous linear equations how to show that to your students in Stella how to give them a conceptual understanding of exponentials using Stella and then how you can mix exponential and linear functions in one problem and, and create something the students can actually solve in high school The two basic building blocks we'll be looking at are the stock and the flow. The stock is um, a level or a state of something. It tells you how much you have of something at a given time. For example, how much money you have in the bank or how much water you have in a pail or how many cars are, on your, are in your parking lot. It could also be something intangible like uh, how motivated you are, the level of motivation you have. Um, the software allows you to change the value of a stock only by, by using flows. So a flow can add or subtract from stock, and we'll see how that works in just a second here. So, oops, sorry. So here's an example um, of a stock. So we have a stock and it has an inflow going into it. The stock represents the water that's in a bathtub and the inflow is the faucet. So we can add water into the bathtub and this will just, you know, add to the stock. We can also subtract from the stock. We can have a drain at the bottom of the bathtub and water can drain out. And of course the level in the bathtub will fall. And we can also add or um, sub and subtract. So we can have a faucet on the left we can have water coming in and we can have water coming out the bottom and if there's more water coming in the level in the bathtub will rise and if there's more water going out the level in the bathtub will fall. You can also see that underneath all this we create an equation which is a finite difference equation so when this was drawn we created an equation that's in the bath the level in the bathtub right now is the level that it was at the last time unit plus how much water we added minus how much water was subtracted, how much water drained uh, times dt. We'll go into that later. So let's look at a simple uh, linear algebra problem, or not linear algebra, but linear equation problem um, for Algebra 1 and Algebra 2 students. So this is a typical problem you'd see in, in Algebra 1 for linear systems or in the beginning of Algebra 2 as a review type problem. We have um, a word problem that most students look at and go, ah, I don't, I don't even know where to begin. Um, but So we have students who are trying to raise money for their school. Um, they're trying to for the class and they're going to do it by selling t-shirts and there's a cost to set up those t-shirts they're going to sell so many and hope they raise enough money and the, the first question of course is how many t-shirts do they have to sell before they make back the money they put in in other words when they break even so they'll look at this and they'll go well, where do we start well one of the things that I would teach my students is well what are the key stocks here so what are we going to look for and they're going to notice that they're going to realize pretty easily that some of the, one of the key stocks is how much money they have to spend for the t-shirts which is represented by this stock called total cost and another one is going to be how much money they make by selling the t-shirts and that's represented by this stock total sales and then they can sit down and they can think about well how are those stocks going to change and realize of course in both cases they're both just going to increase the more shirts I sell the more it's going to cost me because I have to buy them and the more I'm going to make because I have to sell them so they can arrive at this this simple system which you know each one of these is a linear system so this is a linear system and this is a linear system and we go over in the class we'll go over what what the standard form of a linear system is so that also helps them in the software um, and then they just need to fill in numbers to make it work and they can pull numbers out of the problem so for example what is my cost if I bought no shirts, $150 would be my initial value for, for total cost. And of course, we haven't sold any shirts. We have no sales, so that's zero. 
and then they have to figure out the inflows. Well, each shirt costs me four dollars. It's up here in the problem somewhere. Here it is. Um, so that's my inflow, and I make ten dollars. I I get ten dollars for each shirt I sell. So that's my other inflow. At this point, I might ask them, okay, so so now you've been able to translate the word problem into a stock and flow diagram in Stella. So can you then translate that into a mathematical equation, which they may have had trouble from the words going directly to the equation. And they are taught, but you can also notice that the slope has got to be the what's in the flow, and the y-intercept is what's in the stock. So the equation for the, the top structure is just y equals 4x plus 150. And the equation for the bottom one is just y equals 10x. Where x is the number of shirts um, that we sold or bought, that we sold, and uh, y's total cost for the top and total sales for the bottom. So once they've done this, I'll ask them to run the model. So I'll, I'll just run the model, and you can see it unfolding. And as it unfolds, we're seeing that both cost and sales are increasing. And we'll ask them where the break the break even point is. In Stella, you can just drag across the graph, and you'll see along the top here, right here, and right here, the values for the y. And down at the bottom, the values for the x as I drag across the graph. So we can drag across until the top values are equal when they cross and we can see on the bottom that's at $250 and we can see at the bottom that at that point we've sold 25 shirts. I can then ask them to go back and solve the equations and make sure they get 25 for the solution. But I can do other things now. I can look at these graphs and I can say well why on the left is the blue line higher than the red line? And I can wait for them to tell me okay well it's because uh, the cost is higher. I'm spending more money than I'm making, than I've made. And why is the red line higher on this side? Because I've made more money than, um, than I've spent. And in fact, what's the meaning of this gap? We can talk about this gap here. And the gap, the larger this gap is, the more profit I've made. And the larger the gap is on this side, the, the more I've lost. So we can get more direct, and we can actually then go look at, OK, let's look at, um, let's add a calculation of profit to this. So here we have, um, this is called a converter, and it's used just for algebra. And we have these two lines, which are connectors. And these connectors say that profit is based on total cost and on total sales. That's all it says. I'm going to use these two variables to calculate total profit. The profit, and the profit is, in fact, just sales minus cost, as you would expect. If I run this model looking at profit, we see it rises linearly, as we would hope, and there's some slope to that. Um, but the zero is the break-even point at 25 shirts, as we hoped. And we can see that down here, we, we're losing money. It's negative. If you look in the, the top corner here, you'll see as I drag across, it's negative. It goes to zero and becomes positive. And you'll see that after selling 50 shirts, they've only made $150 when their goal was to make $400. So you might then ask the students, OK, well, how many shirts would they have to sell to make $400? They can calculate that separately. They can also uh, run another simulation to try to figure that out and see if they match. And in this way, they've taken the word problem to something that they can see that's more tangible instead of abstract symbolic an abstract symbolic representation of equations. Um, I'm now going to turn this over to Diana so she can talk about um, exponential models. One of the things that um, I have used in my modeling, in my uh, advanced algebra class, my second year algebra class, is a, a sequence of models that I label drug models after a conversation with a research pharmacologist who actually uses Stella in his drug research. Uh, I start very simply in the first semester of almost all second year algebra classes, students study linear and exponential functions. And during the time that they study linear functions, I take a day and take them into the lab and we build some linear functions for some word problems and also actually do some systems problems, linear systems uh, like Kareem showed you. 
Um, and then when we get to uh, exponential functions, I take them into the lab and they do some models, they build some models for some exponential problems. One of the models that they build at this particular time is identified here as drug model one. And um, let's go to the problem. I, it says they, they like being considered physicians. They are then a medical resident at a hospital and a patient comes in and they have to treat this patient. And they administer a drug by giving the patient a shot containing 100 milligrams of the drug and it's directly into the vein so it is essentially considered activated immediately and it is being eliminated at a rate of 0.5%. I have to be very careful with the students when they get to this. This is not their very first exponential model that they do um, because 0.5%, uh, they're not always quite sure of how to represent 0.5%, realizing that it has to be represented as 0.005 um, in any, any representation that we use in an equation or in, in this particular model. The other thing that's important to notice here is that this model is going to represent continuous decay um, as opposed to a system that is generally not uh, decaying all the time. And I want to talk about that in a, in a few minutes, not, not right this second. So let's actually go to the model. This has been pre-set up. What, an exponential model, if you remember your calculus at all, it changes, it increases or decreases as a percent of the current amount that you have. One way to think about it is interest in, a, in an interest-bearing uh, account in a bank. In this case, we are losing the uh, amount of drug from the shot. It's being eliminated from our system in an exponential way because we are losing a percentage of what we started with every single minute. And that is half of a percent every single minute. I would like to show you where we placed the numbers. Um, in the stock, you will see that we placed the 100 there. That was the, big, that was the amount of the shot that we had. And then I would like to show you in the elimination rate, we placed the 0.005 there because that was the percent translated to a decimal. Uh, for the elimination rate, then it's important to, to look at the outflow. Because of the two connections there, um, the outflow depends both on the stock amount and on the elimination amount. And so in the required inputs, when you double click on the flow to define it, you will see that required inputs actually show you that you must use those two items in the definition. So the definition for how much flows out each minute is total drug in the body times elimination rate. Okay, so we see how to set up the model. And as the students would expect, since we're studying exponential decay and they've already done some work with this function, we would expect to have a curved, um, a downward sloping but not straight downward sloping graph here. If we would run the model here, we'll see that the graph that's produced as again, typical of exponential functions, you lose a lot at the beginning because the more you have, the more you lose. Half a percent of a lot is more than half of a percent of a little. And we started with a lot and every, every single minute we have less and less. That's why we lose less and less. And so they're okay with this. They, this makes sense to them. So what I would like now it to do is actually go to a chart. Because in this chart, I want one of the first things that I was curious about when I was beginning to use Stella was, well, how does, how does the output of Stella relate to the output that my students expect to see in their calculator? And so if we are doing a continuous exponential, that means that the base we use is base E, 
And so the equation would be 100, because that's what we start with, e to the negative 0.005t. That's the natural equation that the students would be expected to use in class to represent this particular problem. And you can see the chart there. Um, that they would get if they were doing a, using a calculator. Now, Stella allows you to represent that exact um, situation or uh, other exponential types where the base is not base E, and the default uh, the default integrator, the default uh, method of calculating answers is shown in the next column where the B value or the, the um, value for the relationship between uh, one, one value to the next is 0.995. That would not be continuous decay. And you see that the output of the chart here is not the same as the equation for continuous decay, and that is not what we want to have happen. But by using the integration method provided in Stella, Runga cut of 4, and by using a small interval for calculation, we can see that Stella, the output of the Stella model, reproduces exactly the same output as our calculator does. So there is no problem with having the students feel that the model is not representing what they could do with the equation. It does, in fact, do that representation quite well. Um, so let's go to drug model two. The thing that I like so much about Stella is that you can do the separate functions very nicely with a visual representation as Stella allows us to do. But because of the visual representation, we can then take it beyond what we normally do in class and put some functions together and make the problems much more interesting. So here we are at the hospital again, and we have another patient that comes in. But this patient needs a continuous infusion of some medicine to be able to treat their malady. And so the thing we have here is an IV drip, and it is a constant inflow. Now, I talked to my students very carefully when we were studying linear functions that the constant rate of change, constant inflow, means that we have to have an inflow here that is linear. And because we are eliminating the drug at 0.55%, we are eliminating at 0.55%, well, if we are eliminating at a percent of what we currently have in the system, that means the outflow must be exponential. So we are now having to build a model that has an inflow where the function representation for the inflow is different from the outflow, but it makes a lot of sense that this particular problem would have to be built that way. So let's go ahead to the model and see that we, in fact, have a stock that represents how much drug is in the body. The drug is being infused in a linear fashion and eliminated in an exponential fashion. And we could not actually do this, um, well, not at least in most second-year algebra classes. We could not do this problem on our calculator very easily. Um, so then I asked the students, well, now, this is totally different from anything you've studied. So let's think about how the graph has to look. The person comes into the hospital. They don't have any of this drug in their system. So we must have to start the drug level at zero. So then what I usually do is I have this blank grid there, and I draw a straight line. I say, well, what do we think has to happen? We're sending in drug. We have no drug coming out at the beginning. So I say, does the drug have to increase or decrease? And well, that's pretty straightforward. They say it has to increase. So then I draw a straight line here from the origin, straight up diagonally, and I ask them, well, does that make sense? Should it be like that? And most of my kids will say, well, no, it can't be straight. That would be if it were just linear and didn't have anything coming out. 
And so I change it then and I say, okay, so if it can't be straight like that, how about we draw it straight for about 360 minutes and then change it to straight again but less steep? How about like that? And they go, well, okay, that's better, but it still keeps going up and up and up. I don't think that's right. Eventually, after some conversation, some students, and with sometimes, depending on the class, I have to help a little bit, I say, um, well, there's some coming out, and the more that we have in our body, the more that has to come out. So eventually, the kids come to the fact that, well, wait a minute, eventually the outflow is going to match the inflow, in which case the drug should stay level. And I say, okay, let's actually see if that is what happens. So let's run this and see what this particular model produces. And it is, in fact, exactly what we have gathered by the end of the conversation that we had in class. And yes, that's right. Now, notice there are a couple other little circles up here, little converters. Most, all, all drugs actually, in order to be effective, must act within a therapeutic range. There should be a therapeutic minimum and a therapeutic maximum within whose range we want the drug in the body to uh, approach. It needs to be within that range. So we have set up a therapeutic minimum and maximum. So if we can go to page two, you will see that we in fact did give this patient the right amount of drug so that they were within the therapeutic range. Then I asked my students, do you see where the blue line crosses the purple line? I said, what information is that giving us? What's important about that particular point? And they easily tell me, oh, that's where the drug finally got into the therapeutic level. Well, look down at the time. It's 147 minutes. It took 147 minutes. That's over two hours for this particular patient to get into the therapeutic level, which actually, if they're in pain, is an awfully long time. And we talk about how we might get them into the therapeutic level faster. And um, so then I say to my students, this is one of the reasons we study the solution of systems of equations because the interpretation of where two lines or two curves cross has important physical meaning for us. Okay, let's go to the next to the next model. The problem here says again we're back at the hospital and instead of um, connecting an IV to this person, we are not going to have an on constant inflow. We are going to have this person be given a shot every four hours. Now, the, the model in a minute, we'll take a look at the model. Stella allows you using a pulse command to actually do um, intermittent kind of inflow. So this is really not truly inflow, and we will see that in a minute. So this person is getting a 500 milligram shot of a drug every four hours, which since we have to be consistent with units means we're doing it every 240 minutes, and it is eliminating at 0.5%. So we expect exponential outflow. Can we go to the model now? The model looks like the previous model, except it is not really linear inflow. If we could look at the definition in the inflow, it is a pulse command, which indicates that we are giving 500 milligrams, and then the second number is zero, which means we are given the sh giving this shot immediately at the beginning of the simulation, and the third number indicates the time interval between shots, so that shots are given then every 240 minutes starting immediately um, at the beginning of the simulation. So that allows us then to simulate this um, shot uh, therapy. Okay, so um, this is a slightly different uh, graph, and I don't usually ask my students to anticipate it at the beginning. We usually just run it and then talk about the graph. 
so let's do that. Let's actually run this. And what I do with my students is I ask them, um, does this graph make sense? And they are pretty okay with the graph spiking up and then going down. And I said, now let's just be a little bit more observant here. It spikes up and it looks like it goes down in an exponential fashion. Well, that should make sense because what happens is that we give the, the drug, it's automatically put in, and then essentially the inflow is turned off. So all we have is exponential decay. That's why the pulse shoots up a bunch of drug into the system, and there's no inflow after that. It's just exponential decay. And then I ask my students, well, notice that the peaks of these particular, of each of these uh, shots are slightly different. The first three increase. Why should the first three increase? And then the last three don't increase. And they, after a while, and I don't give them help with this, but they can figure out that the first three increase because at the second shot, all of the drug has not yet eliminated from the body. So we're adding the shot amount to a drug amount that is, all, that is still in the body, so it has to be higher than the first one. And then the third one, it has still a little bit more, so it's also higher. And then I said, well, you know, why doesn't this continue to go up and up and up? And they actually have a little bit of difficulty with that. And I said, well, it's a good thing that it doesn't keep going up, otherwise everybody would OD, which is not a good situation. So finally we have a conversation about the fact that the reason it doesn't continue to increase is a characteristic of exponential functions. The more you have, the more you lose per minute. So we get to a point where the amount of drug in the system is exactly the same amount as being lost between shots. We get to a point in the system where within four hours we lose 500 milligrams of the drug and that's why it levels off. And these are very important conversations, very good conversations, much more sophisticated than we are normally able to do in a second year algebra class, but because we are able to do it with a visual software and with, with the graphs representing the visual situation, it makes sense to students. So if we can go to the second page of this pad, we will see that in this situation we have kept the person within the therapeutic level. And I actually asked them some other questions, but because we're running out of time and I want to get to the next model, I think we better go to the next model. Um, so let's go to the next situation. Now we have a situation where the person has to take pills instead of getting a shot. It's kind of like um, putting two parts of a model together. The pills are taken into the stomach, and from the stomach, they are absorbed into the bloodstream in an exponential fashion because it is at 4.5% 4, 4 per minute that the drug is being absorbed into the bloodstream. Now, it does its work once it's in the bloodstream, and it is eliminating from the bloodstream at 0.55% per minute. So that's an, another exponential process. So we have two compartments here that we're interested in. Can we go to the drug model, please? You will see that this makes sense. We are going to in, input the drug like we had. We're going to have to define it like we defined it for the shot with a pulse command because you take a certain amount of drug, you take two pills of a certain um, level of drug, and we're doing this every four hours. So the inflow is defined like the shots. And then let's look at the fact that it goes into the stomach, and from the stomach it goes into the bloodstream, and that's an exponential process. And from the bloodstream it eliminates as another exponential process. It's kind of like Lego blocks 
once we know our exponential process structure, we can just attach it whenever it's appropriate. And we have our therapeutic minimum and maximum here. And, well, we're running out of time. I don't have time to actually run this. But we can talk about what if people take too many pills, what if they don't take them at the regular prescribed intervals. And we do a lot of study with this particular model as well. Let's go to the summary. What's really important for us to understand as educators is that this is very engaging for students. They are dealing with the information that we want them to gain comfort level with. They are dealing with linear and exponential functions. They are using the um, characteristics of those functions to set up the problems. They can test, what if we did this? What if we did this? Vi very easily, they can expand their models to try new ideas. It is so multidisciplinary. We can, we can change the modules, give them different titles, and, and incorporate problems from biology, from environmental science, from physics, from economics. The focus is on conceptual understanding, and the visual representation really helps us reach more students. In mathematics, of course, we can represent all kinds of functions using stellar linear, exponential, quadratic, convergent, logistic, oscillatory, which, is, which covers pretty much everything, almost everything we want to cover in second year algebra. It's another way for them to see what, how the behavior of the model functions and how that relates to the behavior of the function they're trying to to, um, to learn about. And it addresses many of the national st standards, including a great number of the standards in national mathematics. And I have that actually listed, and we'll talk about that in a minute. I have a comparison of where this applies on many of the national education standards for high school level. Thank you very much. So I think we will go back to Kareem. Thank you, Diana. That was a very interesting presentation. Um, we're going to pause for questions now, and uh, I want you to be assured that any questions that we don't get to, we will post later, and we'll also be recording, posting the recording, so you can listen to it later if you wish to. We are showing a list of resources on the screen in front of you under the questions, and you'll notice um, Diana was just talking about standards and how they're met on this website, which is hers. She, she has those listed if you want to go there and see. Um, but these are all things to help you in your math classrooms. There are units and lessons to help you. So let's turn to some of the questions. The first question is, why are the units in brackets instead of parentheses? Um, as you'll, you'll remember, normal notation for equations, we use parentheses to group things together. For example, uh, if we need to add things before we multiply them using uh, PEMDAS. So um, we can't use parentheses for units. The, any things that are in braces um, are ignored in the equation. So you can type anything. You don't just have to have units there. We also have a separate place that you can enter units. Um, the second question uh, for you, Diana, if you want to take this, how do they understand the physics of these kind of behaviors over time? Well, I, I normally start my class using the motion detector. And I actually discuss um, why constant change produces linear growth or linear decay. So if you're talking about the physics of it, that is an, an actual physical representation. The kids are moving back and forth in the class. And so it helps the connection. Mostly for exponential, I don't have a physical um movement, but I do for quadratics, tossing a ball into the air, again capturing it, but, but it's the vocabulary, and the vocabulary comes from calculus, from differential equations. I don't obviously use calculus type of vocabulary, but I talk about the fact that a, a uh, situation is going to grow or decay as a linear representation of the function if the 
change is constant. So really the focus is on how does the flow behave? If the flow is giving constant input or constant output, you would expect the stock value to change in a linear fashion. If it's a percentage, if the inflow is a percentage of the current amount or the outflow is a percentage of the current amount, you would expect to see a, an exponential representation. So it really comes from the description, the idea behind the differential equation. Does that answer the question, I hope? Yeah, I think so. The, thank you. The, the next question is, um, I teach developmental algebra in a two-year college. How can this be used when we have to get through a syllabus in 14 weeks? And, and I'll start with that and then give it to Diana as well. Uh, my experience is that I can cover the material a little bit faster and um, I, I don't give up anything. And the students walk away with a deeper understanding than they would otherwise. Um, I also am able to reach students who cannot cannot tie um, abstract equations to, to more physical concepts. They seem to understand the stocks and flows better, and they're able to, re to relate to that better. Um, so for those students, um, it's definitely, things are definitely moving faster. Um, do you want to add to that, Diana? Actually, I will just uh, put an exclamation point after what you said. In my classes as well, many, many students are visual learners. Having a visual representation of what they're trying to study with a very abstract looking equation really helps the kids get it a lot better. And I find it doesn't take me any longer at all. And I can actually add more to the class using this representation because the kids get it. They, they get it better. I, I, and some of my students who have difficulty with mathematics, when I take them in to use um, the Stella model, say, geez, I finally understand this. Well, that's, I guess, all I want to say. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Thank you, Diana. Uh, the next question is, how to make kids know the roles of flows and stocks before they understand the models? Um, and I do that in the classroom, typically, because uh, at my school, the lab is a separate separate place, the computer lab. So, so we start off in the classroom, and we, we do sketches, and I introduce the uh, simple, simple drawings of the models, what the stuff stocks and flows do and, you know, try to relate that to the equations. Then we go to the lab and they get to play with it. Um, Diana may have a different situation, so I'll let her chime well, in. Well, my sequence is to start with the motion de detector whenever I can, and the second thing I do is the theory of finite differences. So we actually look at tabular um, change, and then I show them from the table why the design of the actual model makes sense. And so that's one way I do it. But the kids actually don't have too much trouble understanding bathtub, water in a bathtub, faucet in, you know, flow in and flow out. But you can actually hand calculate what's going on, which I think is a good exercise so that they can see the output from the model is just the same as the output they would get if they did it by hand or if they did it on their calculator. Next question. Do you use Stella primarily to demonstrate concept concepts or as a laboratory exercise for the students? Um, Diana? Oh, my kids build them all the time. <laughs> I... I to me, having them build the models is most important. I do a, a three-day drug uh, sequence, and the very first day I do demo some of the problems, but they really get into it when they're building it themselves. So I have them build all the time. Uh, I'd say 95% of the time my students build the models in a lab. Yeah. Yeah, and I can just add to that 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 I, I really don't use it very much to demonstrate concepts. I may I may use a model while I'm teaching just to show them, you know, this is how it might be and this is the concept of it, but you get them in the lab, it's amazing. They 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 pick this stuff up, they run with it and they learn a lot. They they teach each other, they talk to each other. It's it's really great. Um the next question is what is the URL where this webinar will be posted so I may so I may share with my colleagues, and we will email that to you. It will be on the IC Systems website somewhere, but we'll, we'll send that to you. 
the um, the next question is in the t-shirt model how would you show a symbol or link for the number of shirts sold and I am not quite sure what that means uh, or, or symbol or link if you could clarify that that would be great um, the next question is at what age do you introduce Stella with students how often would you use Stella in your lessons? And uh, we're both in high school, but I know people that, that use it at very low levels. Um, I know several projects that, that push to introduce it by fourth or fifth grade. Um, would you like to add something to that, Diana? No, I agree, especially linear models. I know that there actually there are a few classes in the United States that are using linear models in kindergarten and first grade. But I would say reasonably for most kids, it would pro probably be around fifth grade. That's what I would think. Um, I use Stella, I'd say, five to eight times in the year. It depends on, you know... Actually, a lot. Some of it depends on my class, but at least five to eight times during the school year. The next question is how to help kids with exploring new situations, which has no regular or exact data, like zero point five five percent elimination. So I would gather uh, how do you help them um, start to model something where you haven't given them the exact data. And um, my answer to that question is is generally in a in a in a in my math classes anyway where we have a set curriculum we also have set problems and, and they're given numbers like this and you'd have a separate modeling class um, for them to build models from scratch where they may want to where they may want to um, come up with the correct numbers uh, perhaps Diana introduces um, modeling also in her math classes so I'll, I'll let her chime in here no, I, I think you're right. I mean, when we're using this in a math class, the numbers are important because we need to produce graphs and we need to produce tables. Um, if you were in a social studies class, certainly you can use this in the ma in the mapping mode, but that's not what this particular um, application is talking about. It, it is possible to do, just not the focus of what we're trying to talk about in math. Great, and then and then. Um here is uh, explanation for the question I, I wasn't sure about. I guess I would have thought that the number of shirts sold would be shown in a circle with an arrow leading to each of the other stock and flow diagrams. As they were, it felt like the input wasn't shown graphically. It just came out of nowhere. Is there a way to, to show it and to have the model use it? We can certainly um, show it in the, uh, we have little um, annotations. Um, let me show you, for example, very quickly. We go back to the t-shirt model. So here's a version of the t-shirt model. We have um, certainly numeric annotations, and um, I haven't set this up to do it. But I can create a little converter here, which is, in fact, the number of shirts sold. And um, the number of shirts sold, uh, I'm playing a little game here, but um, I can put that in there, and it will tell me how many shirts I've sold over time. So. Um, at the end, I've sold, I've sold 50, which is also here on the x-axis at the bottom as well. So um, we're unfortunately out of time. We have, we have um, a couple of more questions, but we will get to them in the, um, we'll send a, a, a uh, list of the, all the questions that were answered, asked and the answers around to everyone who participated. Thank you very much, and uh, we're we're glad that you could make it today. We hope this was very helpful. Thank you very much.